All right, and next we have Dr. Aaron Boster who came down from Columbus, Ohio. Dr. Boster is a board certified neurologist specializing in multiple sclerosis and related CNS inflammatory disorders. He decided to become an MS doctor at age 12 after he watched his uncle Mark suffer from the disease in an era before treatments were available. Dr. Boster grew up in Columbus, Ohio and attended undergraduate Oberlin College. He earned his MD at the University of Cincinnati of Medicine and completed an internship in internal medicine and residency in neurology at the University of Michigan. He then completed a two-year fellowship in clinical neuroimmunology at Wayne State University. Since then, Dr. Boster has been intimately involved in the care of people impacted by multiple sclerosis. He has been a principal investigator in numerous cl clinical trials, trained in multiple, multiple MS doctors and nurse practitioners, published extensively in medical journals. He lectures to both patients and provides and providers worldwide with a mission to educate, energize, and empower people impacted by MS. He lives in Columbus, Ohio with his wife, Chrissy, son, Maxwell, and daughter, Betty, Betty May. Let's welcome Dr. Boster. <laughs> Yeehaw, howdy. Howdy. You're not gonna jump up? I was gonna let you get down first. No, I'm gonna let you jump up. <laughs> oh, you're not using this. Howdy. <laughs> Bill, you gotta help me out. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? I've never been accused of needing a microphone and they keep giving them to me. So we're going to make use of it. I am going to get rid of this chair. Nobody puts baby behind a podium. And I am absolutely delighted to come down and talk to you. This is really a great experience for me when I get to interact with folks. So thank you for that opportunity. I decided to do MS when I was 12 years old. Not because my Uncle Mark had MS. He had had MS since my earliest childhood memory. I went over to visit my grandmother. She was sitting with my mother at the kitchen table. They were holding hands and crying. Why were they crying? Because they couldn't get a hold of Uncle Mark's doctor and they were scared and they didn't know what to do. This is in an era that predates the National MS Society involvement in our lives. This is an era that predates the interwebs where you could just Google an answer. And I told my mother that I was gonna learn to do it better. I didn't know what I was telling her. I didn't know that I'd go through the 27th grade or be darn near bald by the time I finished my training. But I knew that nobody should make a family feel that scared and that alone. That set me off on a rather unusual trajectory through life. I was the kid in high school that said, I want to be an MS doctor. I chose my undergraduate because it had a special neuroscience program. And in my second week at medical school, I declared that I wanted to do neuroimmunology. I hauled my family up to a state. I'm not allowed to mention the name. <laughs> and I, I did a residency in neurology. And then I stayed for an extra two years to be trained in neuroimmunology. It's been my quest to improve the lives of people impacted by multiple sclerosis. It's something I'm really passionate about. Today... I thought I would talk to you about how to make MS boring. Show of hands, you want to learn how to make MS boring? I, maybe half of you do. The other ones are being polite and enjoying your food. In order to understand how to make MS boring, we have to make sure that we understand what is MS. And in order to understand MS, we have to walk through a discussion of the immune system. So let's do that real quick. The immune system is made up of a bunch of little white blood cells. They live in the bone marrow. And they go to school up in T-Cell University. The, these white blood cells, they're like college freshmen. They have no idea what they want to be when they grow up. All right, and they go to T-Cell University up in the thymus. Now, T-Cell University is a really weird school, right? First of all, it's free, so it's not like an American college. Second of all, there's only one class. Can you differentiate self versus non-self? If I show you one of your own cells, do you recognize it as such? And if I show you a foreign invader, a bacteria, a virus, a parasite, can you identify it as a foreign invader? And when you graduate from T-Cell University, there's only one class, and there's only one profession, and that's soldier. All the cells that graduate T-Cell University, quite literally, they're soldiers, they're given actual weapons, and they run around the human body surveying the human body. 
And when they see one of their own selves, they say, Hey me, it's great to see me. How is me doing today? And when they see a virus, they stop what they're doing. They get out their iPhone 10X plus 3, 7, and they, and they take a picture and they text it to the rest of the immune system. They call in the rest of their friends and they stomp the virus to death. The human body then has an arsenal inside of it. These white blood cells are now trained specifically to knock out that virus and you keep that memory for your lifetime. When people tell you that you can't get chicken pox twice, they're lying. You can get chicken pox a bunch of times. When you're exposed to chicken pox the second time, your immune system has been waiting for that opportunity since you were 12. And it pounces and clears the virus. But let's go back to T-Cell University. Remember I said it was a weird school? What happens at T-Cell University if you fail the class? They take you out back and shoot you in the back of the head. Only cells that can differentiate self from non-self are allowed to live. All the rest of the cells are cleared from the body. Every once in a while, T-Cell University mucks it up. They make a mistake. And there's a kid that doesn't pass the test and they don't murder him. They graduate him. And he gets weapons like his buddies and he goes out and he's a soldier and he's running around the human body and he sees himself. He sees self, but he thinks he's looking at a foreign invader. And he does what he was taught to do in school. He gets out his iPhone 10X, 7D, whatever, and takes a picture of it, texts all his friends. They all come over and they stomp what they think is a virus to death, except what they're stomping on is part of you. That's called autoimmunity. Now, there's a lot of different autoimmune conditions. When the immune system beats up the pancreas, what do we call that disease? Diabetes. Yeah, that's diabetes. That's an autoimmune condition that kills part of your pancreas. When the immune system attacks the joints of the body, what do we call that disease? Rheumatoid arthritis. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune condition where the immune system attacks the holiest of holies, the supercomputer that runs the body, the brain, and the superhighway the spinal cord that takes all the information from the vein down to the feet and then back up. Multiple sclerosis is the leading cause of neurological disability amongst young people. It causes brain damage and can lead to both physical and thinking and memory deficits. Today, I'm going to talk about how we make MS boring. <coughs> Why not talk about a cure, Aaron? I get asked that a lot. Hey, Dr. B, when are we going to have a cure? Very humbly, I don't think we'll have a cure for MS in my lifetime. Now, I would love to be wrong, but our understanding of the immune system is still growing. We're still learning. We've made fantastic advancements in the last 10 years, actually, but we're not there yet. But where we are is in our ability to make this disease boring. Remember how I was talking about diabetes a second ago? Do you guys know that diabetes used to be a death sentence? If you got diabetes, you died after about 10 or 15 years because you went into kidney failure. Nowadays, you don't even know your buddy has diabetes unless you happen to order chocolate cake after dinner. Right? And he gets out this little pen and he says, dude, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm giving myself my insulin. It's not easy to have diabetes. But if you play it right, it can be boring. And in 2019, done right, we can make MS boring. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Now, there are three ways to make MS boring. Treating attacks, treating symptoms, and slowing down the disease. So let's talk about each one. We'll start with treating attacks. What's an attack? A flare, an exacerbation, a relapse. The scientific medical definition sounds like this. <clears throat> a new neurological deficit lasting for at least 24 hours accompanied by neurological sequelae on physical exam in the absence of a fever preceded by 30 days of quiet. Blah. All right, so let's use English. All right, an attack is when something bad happens to you and it lasts longer than a day and eventually you can't hide it from your wife anymore and you got to come clean. I can't see out of my left eye, honey. That's an attack. Right? What's happened is the immune system has inappropriately attacked part of the supercomputer. And that inflammation has short-circuited the wires that run part of your body. And so you manifest a symptom. Now attacks are caused by inflammation. So I need a volunteer. Thank you. Well, let me see your shoe. My shoe? Yeah. <laughs> All 
All right, now, throw the shoe and hit me in the face. All right, so let's give a round of applause for taking her shoe off. All right, but let's just pretend, you're very nice, madam, thank you. Let's just pretend that she threw the shoe and hit me in the face, all right? Tomorrow, my face is more swollen, right? Inflammation doesn't go away in a day. You don't get bronchitis for an hour. You don't get, you don't get tennis elbow for three day, three hours. Inflammation lasts hours, days, and weeks even. And attacks are caused by inflammation in the brain. So the three most common attacks that we see is inflammation of the optic nerve. That's the nerve that runs the eyeball. And you'll experience difficulty with vision and pain when you move the eye. Do you know why? Because the nerve is swollen and it's inside of a bunch of bone and it's actually in squeezing on that nerve. That's the, the, one of the more common attack presentations that we can see. The second most common that we see is called transverse myelitis. Milo is Greek for spinal cord. It'd be too easy if we used English, right? And then itis means inflammation like bronchitis. So myelitis is inflammation of the spinal cord. Transverse myelitis is when the spinal cord is inflamed and stuff doesn't work below it. So typically people will have numbness, weakness, and then the down there's don't work. Are you guys familiar with the down there's? Bowel, bladder, sexual function? And so that's the second most common form of attack that I see. The third is what we call a brainstem syndrome. All the stuff in your face is run by your brain. Moving your eyes around, swallowing, feeling stuff. That's all controlled by the base of your brain. And when there's inflammation in the brain stem, the base of your brain, you can have your eyes become unyoked and you see double, or you slur your speech, or you have numbness on one side of your face, or your face droops, etc. Those are attacks. And one of the ways that we can make MS boring is by treating attacks. So let's talk about how do we do that. Step number one, you have to be seen by a human being. All right? When a patient calls me and says, hey, Dr. B, I, I have an attack. I need you to call in some steroids. I say, nuh uh. And I make him come in so I can see him. I want to give you an example. I had a gal call me and said, Dr. B, I, I woke up, my leg feels real funny and kind of hurts, and I'm having an attack. Will you call me in steroids? And I said, no, come in, let us see you. So she begrudgingly came in to the clinic, and her leg was numb and it was red, and it was swollen, and she had thrown a clot in her leg and had to have an emergency surgery that night, right? So you gotta be seen by a doctor. Why? Because we don't have a handbook to give us all the answers. I, I kinda wish we had like a, a body handbook and you could turn to page 48 and read about the leg, but that doesn't exist. And the human being who experiences stuff that's a neurological word, right? Who experiences stuff, you don't know why you're experiencing it. You don't know if it's inflammation in the brain or if it could be the reemergence of an old symptom because you have a UTI that hasn't even caused any burning yet. And so the first thing we do when we treat an attack is we gotta check you out. We gotta bring you in, into the clinic. I wanna do a quick examination and I need to check to make sure that you don't have a little infection. How do I do that? The most common infection that we see that can trigger a pseudo attack is a urinary tract infection. So we just do a dipstick of your urine. And if you say, Aaron, you're in northern Columbus and I'm here in Louisville, Kentucky, I can't just run up and see you. I'll ask you to go to your primary care doctor and they can check a urinalysis and they can call me. Now, once we clarify that this isn't being triggered by an attack, we can hasten the recovery of an attack by giving you steroids. Now, not like bodybuilder steroids. No, these are corticosteroids. And if I use a gun analogy, forgive it, if a aspirin, which is an anti-inflammatory, is like a 22 pistol, these corticosteroids are like a bazooka. Right? They're very, very potent. Why? Because they have to penetrate into the central compartment, the brain and spinal cord. And so the most common way to give people steroids is we spike a vein through the IV, right? And we drip in a solumedrol drip. We give you a gram of steroids once a day for five days. That's the most common way. And you know, I don't do that very much anymore. There's a lot of other ways to give steroids. You can give pills. You can pick it up at CVS. Now, you gotta take 25 pills each morning for five mornings, and they taste god awful, but it's pretty inexpensive and you don't have to come into an infusion center. 
There's a lot of different ways of treating an attack, but the concept is that we're quelling inflammation in the brain and spinal cord. We quell the inflammation and it allows for a faster recovery. Treating an attack is important. When I was in training, my mentors taught me that treating an attack doesn't change the long-term outcome of MS, and I disagree with that. Because if you let the inflammation smolder, it can cause permanent brain or spinal cord damage. I don't want to allow you to have ongoing inflammation in the only untransplantable organ system. Think about that for a second. You can transplant your hand, you can transplant a face, you can transplant your heart, you can transplant a cornea, you can't transplant the brain and spinal cord. So I don't want to let unchecked inflammation go on. Treating an attack is one of the three ways that I know how to slow down MS. The second way is to treat symptoms. What's a symptom? That's a doctor word. Madam, are you experiencing any symptoms? Right? So what's a symptom? A symptom is stuff that bugs you. Let me give you an example. Let's say, God forbid, you have a transverse myelitis and it makes you feel like your leg is burning. I've had many patients that experience that, where their, their legs are not burning, but it sure as hey, hey, feels like it. And they get some steroids and it gets better, but it doesn't get 100% better. It gets 90% better. And when they're overtired, or when they're super stressed out, or when they have a fever, that burning can come back out. They're left with a residual chronic symptom. And as you move forward in time and accrue neurological damage, brain and spinal cord damage, you can be left with symptoms. Now, I have a pill for every ill. I ain't giving you a pill for every ill because you don't want to take a bunch of medicine and I don't want you on a bunch of medicine. But if something bothers you enough, I want to treat it. See, if I slow your disease down and you're miserable, I did a bad job. I didn't do my best job. And I'll tell you a not secret, I don't do a bad job. In order to make you the most awesome version of you despite having MS, we have to slow the disease down and improve your quality of life by treating chronic symptoms. And people say, well, what's an example of a symptom in MS? Or could this be an example of a symptom in MS? Guys, keep in mind that we're talking about the supercomputer that runs the body. So if you say to me, could MS cause blank? The answer is almost always yes. There's a host of things that can happen. And today, I want to focus on invisible symptoms. A lot of symptoms in MS are invisible. Honey, you look so good. Oh, you don't look sick. Well, you don't look dumb. <laughs> but the reality is that a lot of the stuff that goes on in MS is invisible to the outside observer. And I want to talk about the triad of the three nasty invisible symptoms. Invisible symptom number one, fatigue. Invisible symptom number two, cog fog. Invisible symptom number three, depression. Let's start with fatigue. The number one symptom in multiple sclerosis is fatigue. It's also one of the two leading causes of loss of work in the United States from MS. It's also invisible. And very commonly, someone will say, I'm fatigued. And the person listening will say, yeah, me too. Exactly. So it's super frustrating. And so I've come up with the best example I can to explain to people who don't have MS what MS fatigue is like. Let me run it by you and you can tell me if I'm on point. You ready? All right. So what I'd like you to do in this experiment is go to work on Monday. Come home, have dinner, play with the kids. And when it's time to go to bed, don't go to bed. Stay up all night watching my YouTube channel. <laughs> And then the next day, get up, probably shower, but that's up to you, I won't know. And then get dressed and go to work on Tuesday. Work all day on Tuesday. Come home Tuesday night, have dinner, play with the kids. When everyone else goes to bed, finish watching my YouTube channel. And then Tuesday or Wednesday morning, after not sleeping for two nights, let's go for a walk and have a conversation about fatigue. If you feel me, raise your hand. Right? So fatigue is a crushing pathologic phenomenon. And I think it's caused by unchecked inflammation in the brain. It's an invisible symptom. The second invisible symptom I want to talk about is cog fog, cognitive fatigue, difficulty with thinking and memory. MS does not cause Alzheimer's. People with MS that have cog fog are not going to end up 
like someone with Alzheimer's. They're very, very different diseases. You're not going to not remember who somebody is, but you could pretend. <laughs> but, but you might have difficulty with multitasking, with doing things quickly, with thinking quickly under pressure, with trying to maintain lists. I have many patients say, Aaron, I used to be that guy that never needed to make a list. Now I make a list and I can't find it. Except that's true. Cog fog is the second most common symptom in MS that leads to loss of work. And it's invisible. I've learned by being an MS doctor that one of the hardest jobs is telemarketer. Think about it for a second. I have patients that have been fired from their job because they can't pull off telemarketing because they sit in front of a computer, they have three screens going, they're taking six calls at a time, and it's all timed. That's very, very challenging. Cog fog is a monster. And honey, you look so good. What was your name? The third invisible symptom I want to talk about is mood, depression. People impacted by MS are twice as likely to experience depression compared to the general population. That's a very high percentage. And depression colors everything ugly and gray. Depressed MS patients actually get worse faster than non-depressed MS patients. That's been proven. And again, you look fantastic. They can't see the depression. So let's talk about how we beat this triad of nasty invisible symptoms. Shout out a number, one through 10. Nine. nine. Let's come up with nine <laughs> techniques. You're like, wait, 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 three, three. Let's come up with nine, <laughs> nine techniques to improve these invisible symptoms. And I'm gonna up the ante. I'm not gonna talk about medications, all right? I'm gonna talk about other techniques to improve these symptoms. Now I need another volunteer, not the gal that was gonna throw a shoe at me. <laughs> Somebody else. Will you do it for me? Just keep a track so that I don't go past nine. Okay. Is that fair? That's fair? All right, number one, get a dog. No, I'm, I'm being 100% serious. Getting a dog does magical things for you, all right? A dog is a constant companion. When I come home from work, my wife's on the computer, my kids are playing video games. The only thing in the house that's excited to see Aaron is my puppy dog, all right? And that actually has been shown to help with depression. Having a dog forces you to have a schedule. Because you got to let the dog out, you got to take the dog for a walk, you got to bring it in. And that schedule helps with cognitive fatigue. Exercise helps with all three of these symptoms. And walking the dog is a form of exercise. I could actually talk for quite some time about the benefits of a bow wow. All right, but that's the first one. So we're good with one. I just got to do eight more. We're going to get there eventually. Number two, sleep more. What? Seriously, sleep more. Show of hands. Who got eight solid hours of sleep last night? Raise your hand. Look around the room. All three of you are rock stars. All right, I did not. I tried, all right? And not getting eight hours of restorative sleep, you're cutting your legs off before you start your day. Most red-blooded Americans wind down in the evening, the munchkins are finally quiet and asleep, thank God, right? And, and they want a little adult time. And so they sit in front of the boob tube and they watch the late show and then the late late show and then they surf around on Netflix till like 12 or 12.30 at night. And then they crawl to bed and they wake up at 5.30. Sound familiar? That's not eight hours of sleep. I challenge you to do something miraculous. Take an extra hour of sleep. After the late show, turn the TV, turn the TV off. Turn the TV off an hour early, log an extra hour of sleep and watch what happens to your mood Watch what happens to your thinking and memory. Watch what happens to your energy levels. It's actually phenomenal. Really important stuff. That's number two. Yes. Number three has to do with the PP, the down there's, right? <laughs> so many of us don't drink fluid the way we're supposed to. I'm guilty. In fact, I'll show you. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, that's really good. All right, so many of us don't drink fluids the way we're supposed to. I am guilty of not really drinking water until I get home from work. Many of us don't do a good job. We're not good water drinkers. My grandma used to say, you're not a good water drinker. And then at night after dinner, we're trying to catch up. We're drinking water, we're drinking water. Raise your hand if you sometimes bring a bottle of water to the bedside table. 
Now notice that all the people that raised their hand also did not sleep eight hours a night. You know why? There's a reason. When you drink water, you then make pee pee for the next six hours. No, no, I'm being serious. So if you do advanced mathematics, if you drink water at 6 p.m., you're gonna get up at night to go pee pee. And unless you're gonna just pee your bed and your husband or wife is gonna have to like scoot over a little bit, you're gonna have to wake up and exit the bed, which is interrupting the quality of your sleep, which is gonna make you sleep less, which is gonna result in worsening fatigue and cognitive impairment and depression. So here's the trick. Drink two-thirds of all the water you're gonna drink in the first half of your day. So how do you do that? That sounds hard. No, it's not. I want you to drink a glass of water with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's it. And then I want you to drink a glass of water between breakfast and lunch and between lunch and dinner. And then after dinner, I don't want you to drink any more fluids. Now, I don't want you to walk around the house going All right, I mean, if you need, you need a little sip of water, take a sip of water, but, but don't try to catch up on your water drinking. That will help a lot, a whole lot. Where, what number are we on? We did three, yeah. so we should move on to four, because yeah. eventually you want to go home before tomorrow? Yeah. All right, so number four. Yeah, she's like, yeah, I've got to work tomorrow, and I've got to get eight hours of sleep now, Aaron. That's not fair, but you can work on your water while I'm talking. Number four is to exercise as part of your lifestyle. People that exercise as part of their lifestyle consolidate their sleep. In MS, it improves energy. In MS, it's been proven to help depression. In MS, it can help with thinking and memory. This has been well studied. It obviously helps with energy levels as well. Now, you might say, well, that's all well and good, Aaron. It's hard for me to exercise. I'm not saying it's easy to exercise. It's hard. But I'm going to give you a pro tip. Pro tip. Water is your friend. Water aerobics, water Zumba, walking in the water with a life jacket on and a walker if you need it, for real. If you're overheated, the water pulls heat off your body by convection. If you tend to fall to the left, water pushes back to the right. If you have a weak leg and on solid ground, it's hard to pick it up. In the water, you weigh less. And so that's fantastic. How many of you enjoyed that yoga presentation? Pretty cool stuff, right? You can do yoga at home. So Aaron, I can't make it out to the yoga studio. Well, you've heard of the interwebs, right? There are free yoga programs for people sitting in a chair. So as long as you have access to the interwebs, you could just pull up one of those videos and do it in the chair, All right? My point is exercise is magical in that regard. Number five. five. <laughs> We have to be cautious about recreational drugs and alcohol, right? We have to be, and I'm not telling you to avoid bourbon. I'm not telling me to avoid bourbon. <laughs> but what I am saying is that alcohol is a sedative hypnotic. Many people will drink a nightcap to help them fall asleep. That's actually a horrible idea because when it wears off, there's a rebound insomnia. Alcohol can impair the sensorium. It can actually, it's a depressant. It can actually worsen depression. I'm not telling you to be a teetotaler and avoid completely, but I think we have to consider moderation. I remember when I was in training as a young med student, and I, I was taught to ask, you know, sir, do you, do you drink any alcohol? He says, yep, one drink a day. So I wrote down, one drink a day. And then I went to my attending and I presented, blah, 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 one drink a day. And he goes, what's the drink? And I thought, poop, I didn't ask that. So I went back in and I said, what's the drink? It was a handle of gin. One a day. All right, so I need to learn to ask better questions. My point is, is that we just have to give consideration to recreational drugs and alcohol. Have you guys ever heard of ganja? Marijuana, weed, right? So, so it's very, very hot topic in MS. And one of the things that I think we have to consider is that it's been shown that cannabinoids can impair cognition in MS. And I'm not saying you should therefore never ever do that. I'm simply saying that we have to think about that if we're having problems with energy levels and with fatigue and with thinking and memory. Is that fair? All right, number six. six. You're doing a really good job. Thank you. Um, so number six is polypharmacy. Anybody ever heard the word polypharmacy? So polypharmacy is a doctor word for, gosh darn it, you're on a lot of medicines. The average person with MS in the United States takes seven medicines. That's a lot of medicines. Doctors are very good at giving out medicines. You know what we're not very good at? Taking away medicines. So I'm gonna give you a challenge. 
If the doctor wants to add a medicine, ask her which one they can then take away. Sometimes we don't even remember why a medicine was started and we've just been refilling it for seven years and we haven't contemplated whether we can come off. Sometimes we can cut a medicine in half. Now I'm not asking you to do this on your own. Actually, I'm please asking you not to do it on your own. But I think it's fair to go to your clinician and say, hey, what on this list do I not need anymore? Is there anything I can reduce? Because lots and lots of medications can make you tired. They can cloud the sensorium. And that's important. I'll give you an example. PP pills. All right. Bladder pills are very, very helpful for the bladder. Some of them can worsen thinking and memory quite substantially. Right? And so that's a, that's a really big deal. I'm going to take a sip of coffee because I can't think of any more. <laughs> Number seven. Eat clean. This is weird, but it's true. All right, the science isn't there yet, but I've been doing MS for about a decade and a half, and I guarantee if you try this experiment, you'll be shocked at the result. Cut out foods with excessive sugar. Cut out processed foods. Cut out fast food. Cut out foods that have ingredients you can't pronounce. If you eat real food, you would be amazed at what it does to your energy levels. Seriously, time and time again, I am shocked at the result when people eat real food and they cut out what we in my house call crap. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to throw that out for something to think about. Sound good? All right, more coffee and then I'll think of another one. <laughs> Why did I say up to 10? Oh, good. I'm really glad you're here. Because um, that would be very, very difficult. I, I, I might be able to come up with a couple things. So what else can we do to help with fatigue, energy levels? What else can we do to help with depression and cog fog? We can be socially engaging. Social isolation is a very real thing in MS. And sometimes it's just easier to stay home. You know, your girlfriends want you to come out to dinner and a movie, and then they may go have a drink, and you think, Lord, I, I, I just, I'm going to say no this time. I want you to not say no. Being socially isolated actually makes you more fatigued. That's true. It actually makes it harder to think. You don't have social stimulation coming in. All right? And it most certainly worsens depression without question. All of you today have done something remarkable. You gave up your Saturday, and I assume you don't live in this hotel, and you came here to engage in something. And did you notice that you got more out of it than just the lecturer sitting at a table and talking to your neighbors is engaging? Maybe you made a couple friends, maybe you learned something, or you saw a new outfit that was pretty snazzy. That's a big deal, all right? Along the same lines, I want you to check out a way of engaging yourself cognitively. When you go to Kroger's, you have Kroger's down here. All right, and you go to Kroger's in the checkout aisle, there's all these little books. I want you to pick up a Sudoku or a word find or a crossword or something like that. And I want you to stick them in your bathroom. All right, when you're in the bathroom for 45 minutes on Sunday morning, I want you to do a crossword puzzle. That is socially engaging. That's eight. Number nine is something that I invented called non-talk therapy. What is non-talk therapy? Non-talk therapy is when you identify an activity that is not in your home. It has to be outside the home. It's not for your health. It's not going to a physical therapist or to a doctor. It's not for your job. And it's not like running groceries for your family. It's a different activity. And it has to not be on your schedule. Church Bible study would be an example. Um, knitting circle would be a great example. Book club would be an example. I'm going to use the example of underwater basket weaving at the YMCA, Wednesdays at noon. So let's think about this together. If you sign up for underwater basket weaving Wednesdays at noon, that's $50 for the whole semester. You paid the money, boy, you're out now. You don't go and you don't get the benefit. And Wednesday morning is a different morning. Tuesday night's a different night. Why is Tuesday night different? Because you haven't done your homework yet. And you have to go buy all the gear for the underwater basket weaving. You're buying basket materials and a, and a little two-piece that you feel good in and so on and so forth. Tuesday night's a different night. Wednesday morning is a different morning because what you would normally do throughout the day, you truncate into the first half of the day. And you got to secure your ride and you got to get your tush to the YMCA. Now, obviously, Wednesday afternoon is weird. Because you got a snorkel on and you're under the water, cross-legged, and making a basket. Wednesday night is a different night. 
Because when you're at home and you say to your spouse, honey, what'd you do today? And they say some stuff. Then you say, well, I did this. <laughs> Look what I made. And, and, and you have an entire conversation about underwater basket weaving. And, and that is therapeutic, actually. That's therapeutic. Do we get nine? Can we give her a round of applause for helping me out? I might have done four several times over. Now, I told you that my goal today was to teach you how to make MS boring. I shared with you that treating an attack helps make MS boring. And then I shared with you that treating symptoms to improve the quality of your life is an important component in making MS boring. Highlighting some invisible symptoms and coming up with nine ways of trying to game out how to make it better. There's a third way, and that's to slow down MS. Slowing down MS is very, very important. It's the bulk of what I do in my clinical practice. And I want to teach you a cutesy saying about how to remember how to do it. Because I want you to be four for four in your fight against MS. I want you to be four for four in your fight against MS. Say it with me. Four for four in your fight against MS. There are four things I'm aware of that slow down multiple sclerosis. So how many do I want you to do? Four. Yeah, well, good job, guys. You're picking up what I'm putting down. <laughs> what are they, Aaron? Hold on a second. <laughs> she thinks there's coffee. No, there is. So, <laughs> so what are the four things? Thing number one is to exercise as part of your lifestyle. Feel me here. People with MS who exercise as part of your lifestyle get less disabled 20 years later. Allow that to sink in. People who exercise as part of their lifestyle have less disability 20 years later. That's a big deal. Now, again, it's not easy to do. I'm not, I'm not selling snake oil up here. And you say, well, Aaron, you know, you gave the trick about the swimming pool. I don't have access to a swimming pool. One of the best ways in my mind to get started with exercise as part of your lifestyle is to see your friendly neighborhood neurophysical therapist. Right? To see your physical therapist because they can help get you started on the road to Wellville. Let's do a quick thought experiment. All right? I want you to imagine that I clone you. So your spouse is like, no, no, let's not imagine that. But, all right, but we're just going to, I mean, for the sake of the experiment, we're going to clone you. There's two of you. There's clone A and there's clone B. Now clone A, we're going to give days of our lives TV. Daytime TV at its best. And chocolate cake. Unlimited supply. Clone, yeah. Clone B, we're going to give a treadmill and carrots. Carrots. So we're going to get back together in about five years. Clone A knows everything there is to know about days of our lives and is an aficionado of chocolate cake. Clone A is also deconditioned. Put on some extra weight. Legs are weak. Cardiovascular condition, not very good. Balance is kind of poor. That's clone A. Clone B is a Greek goddess. She looks fantastic. She lost the weight that Clone A found. She has a strong core and strong legs. Cardiovascular system is in shape. Her balance is better than it's ever been. Now, I'm going to pull out a Harry Potter magic wand. And I'm going to cast a spell of a clinical MS attack. Bam! Of left leg weakness. Clone B is limping, rehabilitating, standing, going to work. Clone A is in a wheelchair looking up, wondering what happened. I'm not going to insult you by asking you who you'd rather be. Instead, I want to point out that what we did with Clone A was we allowed her to become deconditioned and out of shape. And she couldn't handle the attack very well when it came. Clone B, we prehabilitated because strong legs handle an attack much better. I want you to be four for four in your fight against MS. And the first one is to exercise as part of your lifestyle. Number two, eat clean and supplement low levels of vitamin D. What does it mean to eat clean? Let me just review it with you again. There's no diet that is proven to slow MS. Now, you might not believe me if you go to Borders Bookstore. You go into the bookstore and say, I have MS. They say, oh, come here. And they show you an entire rack of books written by people that have letters after their name, like mine. But I'm telling you that in 2019, there's no proven science that a particular diet slows down MS, but they can massively improve your quality of life and improve energy levels and improve thinking and memory and make you feel better. And, and I think that's very valid. Again, my recommendation, my opinion, 
It's just an opinion, but you're stuck here listening to me, so ha! My opinion is that you would fare very well to cut out processed foods out of your life. You would do very, very well to cut out excessive sugar out of your life. You would do very well to cut out fast food and soda and eat foods that have names like chicken, apple, water, right? If you have a bunch of ingredients and you can't pronounce it, that's not food. If you would like to do something remarkable on your way home, stop by McDonald's and pick up a Big Mac. Don't eat it, just pick it up, bring it home, open it up, set it on your counter and leave it there for three years. This has been done, you can Google it. Do you know what that looks like three years later? Looks like a Big Mac, All right? It's not, it's not food, right? It's food rots. This is not food. It smells good, tastes good, tastes really good, but it's not food. And so, as I ask you to be four for four in your fight against MS, number two is to eat clean. And I also mentioned supplementing low levels of vitamin D. Vitamin D is more than just a vitamin. It, it does very interesting things in the human body. It acts as a hormone. It also acts as a neurotransmitter. And low levels of vitamin D increase the risk to develop MS. And if you have MS, it makes it look like it moves faster. You get worse faster. Now, y'all live in an area of the world that has sun half the year. The other half the year, you don't have much sun, right? And as a result, we get our vitamin D through the sun normally. When I check levels, vitamin D levels in clinic, it's amazing how low they are. Now, I am not recommending you go to CVS and buy a big bottle of vitamin D pills and eat them like candy. Please don't do that. What I am recommending is that your clinician should draw blood and check a vitamin D level. And typically in MS, we want you to be on the top half of the scale, 50 to 100. It looks like supplementing low levels of vitamin D slows down MS. And we use D3 because it's better absorbed in the body. So that's the second one, I think. Eating clean and supplementing low levels of vitamin D. How many milligrams did you say as far as vitamin D? I said that you got to check a drug, a, a blood level, uh -huh. and then your clinician can give you the amount for that level. Gotcha. But I wouldn't just go and grab a bunch and eat a bunch, because you actually hurt yourself doing that. Okay. Yes, sir? You keep saying low levels. Is there a difference if you have too much? Uh, if you have over 100, that's bad for you. If you have under 30, that's not good. And in MS, I want it above 50. So the sweet spot is between 50 and 100 in my clinic. All right? So the third thing that I want you to do as you strive to be four for four in your fight against MS is to not smoke cigarettes. Smoking cigarettes increases the risk to develop MS. And if you have MS, smoking cigarettes can speed up the disease by upwards of 50%. The MS drugs do not decrease MS by 50%. And for $6.50 a day for a limited time only, you can speed up your disease by 50% by smoking cigarettes. That's remarkable to me. I'm not suggesting it's easy to quit cigarettes. On the contrary, quitting tobacco and nicotine is one of the hardest things for a human being to do. But it's important. It's really important. And if you would like to make your doctor tear up and be so happy, Walk in the office and say, Doc, I need some help quitting. We can help you. We really can. It's very, very important. Unchecked cardiovascular risk factors, tobacco use, uncontrolled diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all of these things actually make MS get worse faster. Now, as you strive to be four for four in your fight against MS, the fourth thing that I want you to think about is disease-modifying therapies, MS drugs. MS drugs slow down MS. And there are 21 different formulations of MS drugs in 2019. When my Uncle Mark got MS, there were no drugs. He was fixed in a wheelchair before the very first drug came out in 1993. There are 21 different formulations of approved MS medicines in the United States. When people tell me, I've tried them all, I say, nuh uh. <laughs> I was in Serbia last week, that's true. I spent Thanksgiving in Serbia, which is a weird place to spend Thanksgiving because they don't celebrate there. And they have two drugs available to treat MS, two injections. That's it. That's all they have. And out of the 12,000 Serbian patients with MS in that country, less than 700 are actually treated. We are blessed in the United States to have access 
to amazing MS therapies that slow the disease down. Now I'm not standing up here today and saying the answer is to take drug X or Y. Nuh-uh. I want to give you some guiding principles. The goal with an MS medicine, as far as I'm concerned, is I want you on the most effective MS medicine you're comfortable with. Right? It's your body. It's your brain. I'm not the one taking the side effects. It's very big of me to be like, it's okay, you can handle it. That's not my right. I'm not allowed to be paternal. I didn't take a class in med school about telling you your risk aversion. I do think I'm ethically required to share with you the good, the bad, and the ugly of a drug and then shut up and hear how you feel about it. I have failed zero times in my career finding a drug that someone who wants to take a drug will take. All right? So I want you to be on the most effective disease modifying therapy that you can. And then we have to see if it's working. How do we know if it's working? Are you guys familiar with the pill? Yeah. Oral birth control? The pill? If you're a gal taking oral birth control and you get knocked up, guess what? It didn't work. <laughs> right? It's because the goal of a birth control pill is to not have an unplanned event called Johnny. If you are taking an MS medicine and you have a clinical attack, guess what? It didn't do the thing you were wanting it to do. That's called breakthrough disease. If you are on an MS medicine and have a new spot on your brain MRI, guess what? It didn't work. My point here is we don't marry our drugs. We date them. And if the drug misbehaves, you're going to delete it out of Facebook and take it off your Instagram. You're going to take it out of your cell phone and say, it's not you, it's me. I'm going through some things right now and I'll call you. And then you never ever call them. And you switch to a different drug. All right? Taking MS drugs is really, really important. It's been an absolute pleasure to get to talk to you today. I wanted to share with you the way that we can make MS boring. Three things, treating attacks treating chronic symptoms and slowing the disease down being four for four. What does it mean to be four for four in your fight against MS? It means to exercise as part of your lifestyle. It means to eat clean and supplement low levels of vitamin D. It means to not smoke cigarettes and to take a disease modifying therapy and make sure it's working. Thank you for your attention. It's been an honor. Great talk, another great, outstanding talk, right? Anybody got questions for Dr. Boster? Yeah. Great, wait. We're gonna pass around a microphone. Re seriously, you have to have a microphone. We and the need... reason is, is because of the interwebs. Hello, interwebs! We, we are Hello, video Facebook! We are video recording, but you are not being seen. It's only your voice. Change it if you don't like it. Change your voice, oh, cut it yeah. out. Okay, on the uh, fighting the depression symptoms, the yes, first one you said was get a dog. Yep. I'm not trying to get out of any work here, but what if the patient is not the one setting the schedule and taking care of the dog? So, is setting the schedule a, a important in that? So a dog is a, so, so the question was, all right, Aaron, you know, you're putting me on the spot here. You're telling me I got to go buy a dog, but, but I, I, I'm going to be stuck taking care of the dog and, and, and dealing with the schedule of the dog and, and cleaning up after the dog. And, and that's not really nice of you, Aaron. I wish you hadn't have done that, right? I'm inferring a tiny little bit. So, so I'm told that a marriage is a partnership and it's a bunch of communication and, and negotiation. Or at least that's the way it feels. And, and so I think if there's a discussion about bringing a dog into the family, there's a discussion about the rules and regulations of who's going to do what. I'll, I'll be honest with you. If you end up doing all the work and she just gets to play with the puppy, she's better off still. All right, and I'm sorry, but I think it's fair to say, honey, what part can you do? Can you keep the water dish full? Can you keep the food full? If the dog poops in the house, is it you? Are you able to let the dog out in the backyard and bring the dog back in? Can you do all those things, please? I have a solution. Do you have small people at home? They're not any better. Okay, all right, all right, all right. That's my solution is we make the small people do it. I, I, I feel for you, sir, I'm sorry. Wait. Any questions? They just came to me. Okay, Hi. I'll take it. Yes. My question is when you talked about under the techniques for improving the invisible symptoms. Yes, ma'am. Um, the one that when you are fatigued, you are you saying you still want us to go out and do things? But sometimes you are so fatigued. Sometimes your family don't understand because they say you look great. Come on, let's go to the mall. And you can't do the whole day at the mall with them. She brings so up what the most do you outstanding do? point. 
Who here has ever heard of spoon theory? All right. So, so she says, Aaron, you know, you say I'm supposed to go out and do stuff and be active and not hide. And yet sometimes my family doesn't appreciate that going to the mall, I, I can't handle that. And then, so what am I supposed to do? Which makes me want to talk about spoon theory. All right. I didn't make up spoon theory. Spoon theory is something uh, that a gal with lupus made up. And, and I think it's brilliant to help family members understand multiple sclerosis fatigue. It, it breaks down like this. When you wake up in the morning, you have a certain number of spoons. And those spoons represent units of energy. So I wake up in the morning and I have 50 spoons. All right? And brushing my teeth and taking a shower, that's a spoon. And making the kids breakfast, that's a spoon. All right? Driving my butt to work, that's a spoon. Getting through the first eight patients of the day, that's five spoons. All right? You feel me? And then you use the spoons up throughout the day. The problem is when you wake up with MS, you start the day off with seven spoons. All right, so you wake up, you take a shower and brush your teeth, that's one spoon. You make the kids breakfast, that's two spoons. You drive your butt to work, that's three spoons. You get through the first half of your day, you've used up all your spoons, you have no more spoons. That's MS fatigue. And so what you need to do sometimes is bank some spoons, all right? So for example, you may have a couple honeydew lists in front of you, all right? Honey, do this and honey, do that. And by the way, honey, please do that. You may need to do the laundry, and the dishes and prepare dinner. You may have to decide I'm not able to do the laundry today. I could do the laundry today, but then I'm going to be completely useless for the next two days. And so I'm going to actively choose. I'll make you dinner. You're welcome. But I'm not going to do the other stuff because I need to save some spoons. And you may need to explain to your girlfriend, honey, I would love to come to the mall with you, but I won't be able to get home. And I have some things tonight that I have to do. I have to save some spoons. So I think by understanding spoon theory, we can be planful about what we do. And I'm not saying you should say yes every time they say, let's go to the movies. I just don't want you to be a shut-in at home and miss out on life. And so there has to be a balancing act. And I find that explaining to your friends and family spoon theory is a great way to explain things. I will sometimes hear educated patients turn to their spouse and say, I have no more spoons. I, I happen to like it when my MS patients show me their MS warrior tattoos. And I had a gal that said, look at this one. She pulled up her sleeve and she had tattooed a spoon on her forearm. So she kept an extra one. That's a great question. Thank you. I think it's, oh, I'm sorry. I think it's great in reference to what she said. But people with MS, our thing is you have to pick and choose what battle you're going to do for that day. Yep. My goal is to try to at least do two things. I think sometimes we put the pressure on, you know, over overextending ourselves. You know, when we got the, you know, when you have MS, you have to die to self. Your old self goes and your new self comes in. And when that new self comes in, I think sometimes we tend to think, you know, well, I'm really upset because I can't do what I used to do. Yep. It's okay. Amen. Say that it's again. Okay. Say it's that okay. Again. It's okay. It's so, okay. So what she's saying is brilliant. And she's saying that when you have MS, you have to be kind to yourself. All right? I, used, I shared with my mother once. I said, Mom, I used to be a state champion powerlifter. I was strong and I was in shape and I felt good. And, and now I'm not. And she said, well, in the interim, you became a doctor. <laughs> right? And, and, and it's true. Um, and I think that you have to be a little bit selfish sometimes. If you, let me teach you a pro tip. You guys got time for a pro tip? This is a magical pro tip. I'm being totally serial right now. Take a nap. Recharge your battery. Taking a nap gives you a couple extra spoons. And I've heard patients say, but, but doc, I feel guilty because I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting on the couch. You're not sitting on the couch because you're lazy. You're being super smart and recharging your battery because you have stuff you have to do in the afternoon. And you're right. It's okay to be selfish. And even though the people around you love you and they, they think that dragging you outside to, to do something is important, sometimes you have to say, th thank you for loving me. Yeah. Right now, I have to recharge my battery. I have one more. In reference to when you said go get a dog, I kid you not, I just went and got a three-month-old. She's three months old. She was, yeah, yeah. Oh, come on, help me out. Yeah. Mine is a little different than that because I lost my 12-year-old 12, 12 poodle. Sorry. So I went ahead and got this puppy. And the thing about it with MS, I think sometimes what we need, 
we need to feel like something something depends on us yes, yes. we need to feel needed yes and with this puppy i swear to god she works the heck out of me okay yeah, she does she works the heck out of me but i love her yeah to and that's death. that's a beautiful thing i love her to death yep I, that's a beautiful thing um i i think that's a great point thank you for sharing it other questions or comments raise your hand please so i know where to go to Um, kind of piggybacking off her, I sometimes come home from work, I can't have a conversation because, like, my brain can't even process a, the simplest thing, like, what we're going to do tomorrow. Can we just talk about it later? Because I just can't even... So, so that's very real. You used up all your spoons. You're having cognitive fatigue. And... If you have a supportive significant other, and I, I happen to know that you do, you can have an, what I call an a priori conversation. That's a, 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 a preset conversation where there's an understanding that when you get home from work, there's an hour where there's no discussion. There's no talking. That's downtime. And there are no social plans immediately after work, ever. I, I get home from work and I am so spun up on 16 cups of coffee and my mind is spinning with all the patients that I've seen I have difficulty when I get home decelerating. My wife sends me upstairs to my room. <laughs> or sometimes outside. No, I'm being serious. And, and we have an understanding that I get about a half an hour to just sit and decompress so that I'm not a, a raging lunatic at home transitioning from the work day to taking care of my family and interacting and being a social human being. And so in the same fashion, I think it is reasonable if you know that, plan around that. Right? No, you're not going to meet someone after work to go do some shopping. Uh-uh. Because you're going to need that downtime. And that's okay. That's okay. Question recently given to me by somebody off the internet to ask you was, how do they know when their MS Med is no longer working and they're not getting spots on the brain? So I think we need to discuss a change in therapy if one of five things happen. If one of five things happen, we're going to discuss a change in therapy. Number, and so if you're taking your medicine the way you're supposed to, right, that's, I mean that, you have to be taking it the way you're supposed to, and you have an attack, we need to discuss switching. I'm not saying we're switching, we just need to talk about it. If you have a new spot on your MRI, despite taking the medicine, we need to talk about switching. If you have new neurological symptoms on your examination, we need to talk about switching. If you can no longer tolerate the side effects of the medicine, we need to talk about switching. Or if the safety profile of the medicine is no longer acceptable, we need to talk about switching. If any of those five things are going on, we need to have a conversation about doing something different. I'm not saying we're gonna do something different, I'm saying that we gotta talk about it. I'll give you an example of a gal. We started her on a medicine, didn't have an attack. Her exam stayed the same. MRI was clean, all right? Medicine was safe. Her hair fell out. That, that's true. Boy, she was mad at me. All right? And I tried to tell her it looks good, but she didn't buy what I was selling. And so that's not acceptable. All right? That was one of those five things, and we switched. And her hair came back. Mine didn't. That was a great question. Thank you on the internet, whoever asked that. Next one. We're not live streaming. These came to me overnight, good knowing deal. that we were doing this program. Person wants to know, well, person has pain. Pain in her feet. She wants to know if the pain in her feet is orthopedic or or if it could be MS related because she finds that when she walks a lot, she's got more and more burning pain than just what she feels is skeletal pain. So again, if we had a handbook for the body, we could turn to page 58 for feet and read the answer, but I've never seen that book. And the human being doesn't necessarily know why they're hurting, they just know they're hurting. Sometimes it takes talking to the clinician to sort out what is what and what isn't, right? Sometimes it's not straightforward. And as my late mentor Omar Khan used to say, sometimes nature's too generous and you can have MS and diabetes. You can have MS and you can have broken your ankle or strained your foot, or you can have neuropathic pain or you're wearing too tight of shoes. And so the answer requires some investigation to get to the bottom of it. Um, and working with your clinician, you can cross things off your list and, and do some work to figure out, 
could it be this or could it be that? Only after you've done that and you narrow it down can you, then you start a treatment regimen. Next, a person wants to know what they do about the itching of their body. So itching is a form of pain. Did you know that? Itching is a form of neuropathic pain. When you damage the spinal cord, it can cause a crushing sensation, a burning sensation, a cold chilling sensation, an achy sensation. It can also cause itching. Pathologic itching is not uncommon in MS and drives people nuts. I've had patients that literally they bleed because they're scratching themselves so bad. The medicines that work to treat neuropathic pain, things like gabapentin, things like that, they can also work to treat pathologic itching. And if you conceptually think of it as the same thing, that works very, very well. Great question. Next is the one about stem cells. Okay, and what actually is going on in the United States with all these clinics that are in all these different states taking out body fat and just putting it back wherever they want? Yep. Anybody here heard of a stem cell transplant? Stem cell transplantation at first blush sounds sexy. Woo wee! You go somewhere exotic, they take out your bone marrow, they give you a new uh, immune system and they've cured your disease. Sounds, sounds pretty awesome. A stem cell transplantation is not a treatment, it's a procedure. And it's not prime time. Let me explain to you the reality of what a stem cell transplant is. First, they harvest stem cells. Well, there's lots of different ways to do this, but this is a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. They harvest stem cells. They give you medicines that make you make a bunch of white blood cells, and they harvest your stem cells, and they put them on ice. Then they murder you. They give you lethal doses of chemotherapy, and they erase your immune response for the rest of your life. You have no immune system. You're a boy in the bubble. You will die. But before you die, they give you back your immune system. They give you back those cells and hope they take. A stem cell transplantation is a very, very serious procedure. Now, we've been studying stem cell transplants in MS for over 20 years. And in the beginning, there was an undue amount of death from the procedure. It's gotten safer, but it's not prime time yet. I've done four stem cell transplants in my career in the context of a clinical trial for MS. I don't think we should do stem cell transplants outside of clinical trials just yet. And I want to caution you about stem cell tourism. Anybody heard of stem cell tourism? Yeah. There are exotic places in the world that you can travel to like India or Mexico or Chicago where for $25,000 they will swap out your bone marrow. And that's a really bad idea. The American FDA has cracked down on stem cell clinics um, which are in some cases predatory. I do believe that stem cell transplantation will become a thing in MS, but it's not prime time yet. When a patient comes to my office and says, Doc, I want a stem cell transplant, what I hear them say is, Doc, I want to be aggressive in how we treat my disease, which I think is awesome. But I don't necessarily think that the best answer in 2019 is to run out and get a stem cell transplant. Hi, Dr. Boster. Howdy. Um, <laughs> first of all, I just wanted to say it's such a pleasure to see you speak in person. I've been following your YouTube channel um, for the past year or so uh, since I was diagnosed. Um, I live here in Louisville, but I'm originally from Ohio, so I'm a fellow Buckeye, and one of my family members came across your channel when she was researching um, MS, and it, it's been tremendously helpful. Thank you. And you've really helped me navigate my first year at this diagnosis. That makes me feel really good. It, it, it's like meeting a celebrity today. Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is, um, so I fall into the clinically isolated syndrome pre-MS category, uh -huh. and um, I'm four for four, um, but I'm wondering about, as far as DMTs, um, what you typically recommend to patients or what approach you take to folks who have clinically isolated syndrome? That's a great question. Um, at the risk of a selfless plug, I, I have this YouTube channel. And I started it a couple years back to help educate patients between visits. And what I realized was you don't have to be my patient to benefit and so you honor me, thank you. Um, I want to also point out our hosts, MS Views and News, has one of the largest repositories of MS lectures in the universe on their YouTube channel and on their webpage. And if you haven't seen that yet, you most certainly want to check it out because it's really the who's who and what's, what's hot in the pulse of MS. And those are resources that I think um, are fantastic. 
The reason I like the YouTubes is because you might not be ready to learn something during the time that your doctor has allotted to talk to you. Or they may have to go over some other stuff and don't get to it. And you may need to learn something at 3 o'clock in the morning when you wake up and can't stop thinking about it. And you can just pull it up on your phone and you can watch it. And, and I think that's awesome, so thank you for that. Um, you talk about clinically isolated syndrome. That's the first event of what may go on to develop into MS. Right? And there's some science behind the risk of someone with CIS going on to have MS. And obviously without looking at your pictures and all that, we, we can't say for you specifically. But in my mind, clinically isolated syndrome puts you at risk for MS. I like to treat people with clinically isolated syndrome, with medicine. And if you make it out, say, 10 years and never have anything else happen, we could have a conversation about maybe coming off, the, yeah, that's maybe a good problem to have. But we have to consider the risk benefit of the medicine. Medicines are not benign. If a doctor tells you a medicine has no side effects, run. Right? Because that's not true. And so, as an adult human, we have to weigh the risk and the benefit. My opinion is I'm much more scared of untreated or undertreated MS than I am of the side effects of the medicine. But that's real big of me because I don't have to take it. And so, that's my opinion, is that I tend to want to treat clinically isolated syndrome. And I'm very open and honest and say, maybe you weren't going to have something happen, but I would rather stack the deck in your favor. It's kind of like thinking about this. Has anyone here ever worn a seatbelt? If you have, raise your hand. All right. So how often do you wear your seatbelt, sir? Roughly. Yeah. 90% of, of the time. How many car accidents have you been in? Five. Five. So why are you bothering wearing your seatbelt 90% of the time? Why don't you just wear your seatbelt five times? <laughs> right? So obviously, rhetorical question. He doesn't know when he's going to have a, a car accident. And so he wears a seatbelt to protect himself ahead of time, right? In the same fashion, when someone has clinically isolated syndrome, particularly when they have spots on the brain that increases their risk, so on and so forth, I want to stack the deck in their favor. And so that's, that's my opinion and my approach. Thank you. I'm going to save a spoon. I'm going to get her question first, then I'll go over there. That's fair. There's a doctor here in Louisville that he's promoting poop transfer for MS. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll explain that to you. So you might not have heard her, or you might have thought you didn't hear it correctly, but you did. So, so she said, there's a doctor who is promoting a poop transplant to treat MS. That's what she said. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. And it breaks down like this. In our gut, is something called the microbiome. The microbiome are all the communities of bacteria that live inside you. Do you know there's more bacteria in you than human cells? We're actually more bacteria than human. That's the like fact. And the entire gut is lined with entire communities of bacteria. In the setting of autoimmunity, including MS, there's a fancy word called dysbiosis. Dysbiosis means there's wackadoodle bacteria that are maybe not the right kind in your gut. And there is some early evidence that that might influence the nervous system. There's a theory being tested that if we could change the bacteria in your gut, it might have an influence on the MS and improve MS. Did you notice that I said might in theory? Did you catch that? Because it's not proven yet. So there is research going on presently studying ways of manipulating the gut microbiome, altering the gut microbiome. I'll tell you a not secret. We don't know the right kinds of bacteria yet. And so whereas maybe a poop transplant might help reset dysbiosis and improve the microbiome, I don't think that you should do that outside the context of a clinical trial where you have made a sacrifice of sacrifices to participate in this unique clinical trial to sort this out. Now, there's other ways to think about it. Anybody ever heard of probiotics? Yeah. Probiotics are a bunch of bacteria in a capsule. And some people think, well, gosh, if I take a probiotic, I could change my gut flora. And that's true, but we don't know which probiotics we need. So there's more research. One of the things that I love 
about working with people impacted by MS is that you are motivated and you're inquisitive and you want to understand. And you typically have your fingers on the pulse of what's cutting edge. And I, I love that. As a doc, that's a pleasure to get to work with a motivated uh, person that wants to work with me and stay on top of what's the deal. I also think that when we are on the cutting edge, we're going to learn about things that turn out to not pan out. I'll give you an example. A few years back, there was an Italian vascular surgeon that thought if he cut your neck open and washed out your vein, that it would help cure MS. That's not true. That's false. It doesn't work. But he didn't know that. And there was research done that proved that that didn't work. But before the research was even done, there were clinics around the world that started just to do it. And a couple people died. And so my point here is, I'm not recommending a fecal transplant today. I am following the research very carefully. And maybe one day we'll have a better sense of how to manipulate the microbiome, which is fascinating. Um, but I'm not asking my patients to, yeah. <laughs> Next question. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned about uh, gabapentin. Yes. If, uh, like, I was diagnosed 12 months ago with MS, but I've been taking gabapentin for years. Yep. And now one of my, one of my main things is the brain fog. And uh, does gabapentin affect brain fog. Yes. So all medicines have side effects and medicines that made a lot of sense yesterday might not make sense today. And we have to constantly weigh the risk benefit of a medicine. I've had situations, sir, where someone, and I'll use gabapentin just because we're talking about it. I could use a different drug. They, they have a benefit from the gabapentin in the nerve pain, but it makes it hard for them to think. So they either have to not take it or change how they take it or change when they take it. Now, I'm not telling you to just wackadoodle mess around with your medicines and see what fits. I am suggesting that you talk to your clinician and say we have competing problems here. I have pain, I have thinking and memory problems, and what might we need to do? And with that information we can tweak and adjust what we do. That's a great insight. And we have to constantly reevaluate the therapies that we're using so that they make sense. Thank you for sharing that as well. Okay, great. Over in the blue. I just blew all my spoons having to run over there now. <laughs> Poor guy. Can we give Stuart a round of applause? Um, do you believe that MS is hereditary? Because my mother has it, my husband's mother, her sister, and her aunt, all of them have it. Um, so MS is not sexually transmitted, just to, just to throw that out there, okay? Um, the, the question was, is MS hereditary? Now, MS has a hereditary component, but it's not like a classic hereditary disease. There are conditions like sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis, where if you have it, a certain number of your children are going to have it, right? That's, those are like classic genetic conditions. In MS, it's not that straightforward, of course, right? That would be too easy. And so we have constellations of genes that encode for eye color and height, like I have real tall genes in my family. And also we have genes that encode for the immune response. And we believe that one of the factors that can lead to MS are, ge are immune genes that lead to a higher risk of autoimmunity. If you look at a population of people, not a family, but like a population like, like the Midwest, if you have a, a population, the risk of MS is maybe like 1 in 350. If you have MS, though, your first degree relatives have a risk of about 1 to 3 percent. It's not 100 percent, it's not 50 percent, but it's higher than the general population. There are certain families, and it's not common, but you describe one, where there is auntie, cousin, myself, and my daughter all have MS. That's the make-believe example. And that's not common. Remember how I said I don't think we're ready to cure MS yet? And I said the reason was we're not there. Our understanding of the immunology is still growing. And this is a great reflection of that. There are studies going around the country right now trying to understand the underpinnings of what causes MS. And obviously, Looking at family members and genetics is part of that puzzle 
Thank you for the question. Yes, you were talking about gabapentin. I've worked with my doctors and we've br brought it to a lower level. Is there anything that, are there other alternatives to gabapentin? So she says, I'm on this medicine and we're trying to tweak it, but is there, are there other medicines? And the answer is always yes. It doesn't matter what the problem is, bladder, cognitive fatigue, burning pain, double vision, what have you, depression. I can think of 10, 15 medicines typically that can be used to treat that individual condition. And so, unfortunately, we don't have a tricorder. You guys know what a tricorder is? <laughs> yeah. So you remember one of the, the most famous doctors in Starfleet is this guy named Bones McCoy, right? And he was a gruff, a gruff doctor. Some people think he was an alcoholic. And he had this cool device, all right, he had a tricorder. And he would walk up and flip it open. Damn it, Jim, they have a mess, right? And he would, he would figure it out with his tricorder. And then he would get a hypo spray. And he would inject the person and they'd magically get better. We don't have those tools yet. And so we're stuck in the stone ages where we identify a medicine that should work and we try it. And we ramp it up and we see how it's tolerated. And if it doesn't work, we ramp it down and we do another one. And then we try the second one. And we try the third one. And that's frustrating. But that's where we are with science today. There are certain conditions like oncology where we're starting to get very savvy and we can look at genes and stuff and figure out ahead of time which medicines might work. We're not there yet in MS, but actually that research is going on. I think before I cash out of this life that we will draw blood and look at the immune profile and the genetic profile and that will guide us in our treatment decisions. But we're not there yet. Great question. Another internet question, it beeth that, especially for a lot of members in this uh, room tonight or today, um, as we age, okay, there are insurance companies that believe that we shouldn't be on medications anymore. <coughs> Sorry, you go on. <coughs> Very good, you need some water, I guess, yeah. Um, and there are those of us, a second part of this is that there are those of us that have done so well over 10 years that the insurance companies think that hey, this person doesn't need the medication anymore. What happens? So th that person's asking an insightful question uh, about the reality of, of health care in the United States. Uh, and we need advocates. Your number one advocate is yourself. All right? You also have an advocate in your, in your immediate village, your close friends and family. And your clinician better be your advocate. And sometimes we're faced with weird things where um, someone who's not directly involved in our care says, well, we don't think you need that anymore. And that's when we roll up our sleeves and we fight. All right? And we normally win when we fight. And so I've had examples where a young lady was diagnosed with MS, actually a young lady that I went to grade school with. Um, and we put her on an outstanding medicine and she's done great on that medicine. And she was on the medicine for five years, had no disease activity. She switched insurance and the insurance denied her that medicine and said they wanted her to try a bunch of other things. And so I had to have a little conversation with that doctor on the other end of the phone and said, I don't think you understand, sir. And at the end of the conversation, he apologized and we left it the way it was. All right. The, 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 that's frustrating. All right. But that's the right fight to fight. And you need to have an advocate. And I want your clinician to be your advocate. There's a movement in the United States, which really actually bothers me quite a bit, if I'm honest, where some doctors are asking the question, should they stop MS medicines when you reach a certain age, which I call ageism, right? And so I personally believe that we should never treat you after death. I think that's actually stupid, right? So if you die, I don't want to give you any more medicine because the medicines don't work when you're dead. But if you still have an immune system, and you still have functions in your body that you like, like seeing, or eating, or waving, or picking your nose, or what have you, I want to preserve the reserve. I want to preserve that function. And it's true that as we age, our immune system quiets, but you still have one, it can still be overly active. And whereas you might be less at risk for an attack as you get older, you're also less well able to bounce back. And so we might keep you on a therapy for a different reason, not because you're at high likelihood of having an attack, but because the consequences could be more severe. 
And so there's research going on right now looking at should we stop MS medicines when people reach age X or Y. And I disagree with that. I do think that as we get more savvy in the future, we'll talk about de-escalation. De-escalating the, the medicine, not stopping it completely. If you think about like oncology, we might give you a very hardcore therapy up front called induction and then put you on maintenance. And I think that in neuroimmunology, we're kind of moving towards that model. I think that's coming. Thank you very much. There's a question over there. There is. My question is, can the doctors that deals with us with MS talk to the insurance doctors that you, wouldn't they have day, us on, on, day. on they have us on medication that will, that's working for us and all of a sudden their doctor says we don't need it so so this is a very real situation that I deal with on the daily actually and it's frustrating for everybody. Um, some of you might know uh, one of the preeminent MS neurologists in the United States is a gentleman named Elliot Froman. I consider him to be a friend and a mentor. He's a great man. And I'll borrow a trick that he taught me. I use it all the time and I'm gonna share it with you. And here's what happens. Um, we put some, we wanna put someone on a medicine and the insurance denies it. And so then we appeal it and they deny it. And so now I'm doing a peer to peer, all right? And unfortunately, oftentimes, they're not a peer. They're not a fellowship-trained neuroimmunologist. Sometimes they're not even a neurologist. Sometimes they're not even a doctor. But, but nonetheless, I'm talking to this human on the phone. And I explain to them the rationale for why we need to do something. And if they say no, I say, no problem. You're now their doctor. You're now making a medical decision despite never seeing them, never touching them, never looking at their complete records or their MRIs. You're now ethically and medically responsible for their outcome. I need your DEA number and I need your medical license and I'm putting it in the chart and I'm documenting that if the person has irreversible neurological damage it's your fault. What's your DEA number? And sometimes they recant and sometimes they give it to me and I put it in the chart. And I'm not trying to be sassy pants and if you're listening to this right now or if you're watching this uh, on the interwebs later I'm not asking you to get in bar fights. I'm simply sharing that we have to be your advocate and we are. Um, and and your, your doctor's office does that. And it's hard work, but it's worth it. I have two ways that I treat my MS that hasn't been mentioned. Way number Particularly, one? Particularly, number one is I try to smile all day long. It gives me an automatic facelift as well as upping my mood and an attitude of gratitude. Mm -hmm calms me down, helps me a great deal, and I'm so grateful for this program. God bless you. And for everything that you have done, because I have been at your programs before, and what you have done also for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Just really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. You told me more of it earlier, you know. <laughs> Questions over here. I saw some hands earlier. Yes. Oh, well, I was just going to make a comment on a question, but you're talking about talking to the insurance companies, and I just got an email like two weeks ago that as of January 1st, they're no longer going to cover my medication, yeah. And I called the uh, pharmaceutical company, and she said, we are aware of the problem. We're trying to figure out what to do. So, yeah, it's real. It's very I real. I mean, yeah, as of right now, I don't know. I don't know. And it's frustrating, and it's yeah. important to fight. Yeah. Yep, we have to fight the good fight. The problem isn't only the pharmaceuticals, a disability office. Every three years, they reevaluate, which brings up a lot of stress and can cause problems in itself. Yep. The, um, our healthcare system isn't perfect. No healthcare system is perfect. And we're touching on some very important issues, um, and we're not going to find answers today. I just want you to know that it takes a village, and these villagers want to fight with you and help you. How about the Adderall crisis, the, you know, the op opioid crisis? Each state, do they each have their own rules, each pharmacy rule, each health care rule? To me, that's the stressor. To, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. I most certainly do. Yeah. <laughs> so she's, she's talking about what about these medicines that are controlled substances where you can only write one month at a time and it has to be a paper script. What's up with that? There are rules and regulations in place for protection for people, actually, right? And, and that's a good thing. And, and I wish 
stimulants like Adderall didn't work because they're very, very annoying to use. But I have to use them because they work very, very well. And that's super frustrating. And it's frustrating for the person that has to get the script each month and it's frustrating for the doc that has to write it. And it's not a perfect system. Um, most of those laws that you're referencing are federal laws. They're, they're, they're not one state or the other. Um, and I don't have an easy answer. I will sometimes try to use other medicines to see if I can help that particular symptom before we move to a scheduled substance. But at the end of the day, we got to do what we got to do. And sometimes that involves some frustrating things. It's absolutely true. Sir? Uh, me, I've got uh, diabetes and MS, of course. Uh, but I've got like four or five specialty doctors, one for my back, MS, and other things. These doctors are, seem like they're hard to communicate between each other. And a couple weeks ago, I downed it now myself. But I was taking up to 23 or 25 pills a day of different ones. What is too much? So the gentleman says, sometimes nature's too generous and you can have MS and a failed back and diabetes and you might find yourself talking to multiple different subspecialists. And if I make a quick comment, when doctors communicate, it sounds like we're fighting. I'm, I'm serious. The way we, we use a very formalized way of communication, we're taught this in school, and to the outside observer, it sounds like we hate each other. And we use weird words. It, that's actually the way that we communicate. It's not as bad as it may sound. And, and you're right, there has to be a sense of communication. Let me throw out a couple ideas. Idea number one is, when you see doctor number one, all seven of those doctors get a note. And you get a note. And you bring it to your other doctors. Tip number two, if your doctor one wants to change doctor two's medicine, make them call that doctor and say, I, I, I don't know that I can explain this adequately, I need you to help out. Tip number three, the primary care physician can serve a very wonderful purpose of being the center of control because they're kind of looking at you holistically. And the pulmonary specialist might be so focused appropriately on lungs that they're missing the foot specialist over here. And so the primary care doctor can help with that. Tip number four is your medication list should be something that you keep in your pocket, laminated. And every time you see one of your seven doctors, I want you to A, say which med can we remove? And B, which one might we be able to double up on? And, and, and that's hard work, but it needs to happen. That's the only thing, I mean, because with all them pills, my sugar was spiking to five, six hundred. It wouldn't come down, then it go up. And that's yep, got to gotta work together. It takes a village. And villagers have to talk to one another. Last questions, anybody have? I have a last question. Did you all enjoy? Yeah. Do you appreciate this guy over here? Yeah, very good. Thank you, guys. Hey, MSU's the news will... Be back again next year. That's all I can say. Sometime next year. Maybe right not in Louisville. Maybe we'll get outside somewhere. So if you really want us to come closer to where you might live, if you're outside of Louisville, please send us an email and let us know what you know we can possibly do in your area. And again, I want to thank Celgene and Santa Fe Genzyme for providing what they have, You know, giving us the funding to do this program. And again, I thank you all for coming. That's the end of today's program. Thank you guys, it's been a pleasure. Great, thank you. Thank you everybody for coming.